Okay, so uh, this is a talk about uh, the, uh, a version of Anderson localization, which is in Anderson's original paper, but has mostly been neglected since then over the years. Um, and it's also, as you'll see, about uh, fundam the fundamentals of quantum statistical mechanics uh, in an interesting way. Okay, so uh, uh, in 1958, Anderson wrote his famous paper about localization. Um, and uh, what he was trying to treat at that time was not particle in a random potential, which is what this paper is so famous for. He was treating the many-body localization of spins, of spins, and in fact at high temperatures. So he was, if you read the beginning of his paper, the problem he was trying to solve is the one I'm going to be talking about today. He made certain approximations to that problem, which reduced it to a single particle problem, which he made progress on. Um, and uh, people have mostly focused on, on, on that since then. Uh, so unlike the usual discussion of Anderson localization, what I'm talking about today differs in two important ways. One. It's many body, meaning it's not single particle. It's many degrees of freedom, which are inter strongly interacting with each other. And we're talking about non-zero temperatures. And in particular, I'll be talking about high temperatures. Um, so most of the work on Anderson localization is about the single particle problem. And most of the work that's about the many particle problem about Anderson localization is usually focused on zero temperature. So this, is, so this is different in that respect. Although a number of people over the years were looking at this problem. Um, but it was brought back to my attention and, well, it was brought to my attention because I had never actually read the beginning of Anderson's paper carefully. <laughs> it was brought to my attention and brought back to the community's attention by a very nice paper in 2006 uh, by Bosco Alainer and Altshuler. And this paper was about many-bodied localization of particles, interacting particles, um, and, and very importantly at positive temperatures. Um, and they made the very strong statement, uh, which is very striking, that uh, you can have a, a system of of many interacting particles at a non-zero temperature, but yet the conductivity of those particles can be strictly zero. The DC conductivity can be strictly zero uh, in spite of them interacting with each other and being at a non-zero temperature. Um, OK, and there there's a number of works in between, but I'm not going to say any more about the history than that. Um, Yes. Um, okay. Yes. Okay. Single particle localization is is well, it's it's a particle in a random potential. The random potential is time independent, and then you just solve the Schrodinger equation for the eigenstates of the particle in the random potential, and those eigenstates can be localized, meaning they, not that they have finite support, but that they have a place where they have a maximum in magnitude away from which they decay exponentially. Uh, and so those are localized states. Single particle, localized single particle eigenstates are just eigenstates where the wave function of the particle decays within some exponential envelope away from some place where the particle is localized. Um, and extended states, which are the opposite, are ones, eigenstates, that visit the entire system, or at least visit near every point in the entire system. Um, right. OK, so the types of models I'm going to be talking about, 
I'm going to talk about spin models. OK, so you can do particles. This is a you know, rather general topic. You can be talking about particles. You can be talking about spins. And so let's look at models of uh, this is the simplest quantum discrete system, two level systems, so spin a halves. Or we could call them, nowadays, people call them qubits. Um, or they could be lattice particles, right? So if you have a particle, particles hopping on a lattice, say there's only one type of particle, that la and there's only one particle allowed on each site, then you have a two-level system at each site, which is the particle is there or it's not there, right? And so two-level systems can describe particles hopping on lattices or just any, any sort of interacting two-level systems. And I'm actually going to write down uh, three different models. One is the general type of model I want to talk about. One is the one that we looked at carefully. And then, uh, and then I'm just going to write down another one, which is perhaps the simplest version, which, which uh, John and Tom are perhaps hoping to actually make a proof about um, localization. Um, okay. So I'm going to write down three models. Okay. So, so let me just first do the general. So the general model. Okay. So now we're talking about quantum mechanics, time-independent Hamiltonian. So we have a time-independent Hamiltonian, which gives the dynamics of our quantum system, um, and it's going to be spin a halves, which I'm going to call S i. Operator S is the spin operator at site i. They're on some lattice or graph in a finite dimensional space. Um, typically thinking about one, two, or three dimensions. Okay, and what we're going to have is random fields, so random splittings of the two levels of the local two level system, and interactions. Okay, and I'm just going to give the interaction rather generally, say, allow any two spin interaction. Um, okay, so some comments about this. So this is a static random field. And in the case of lattice particles, it would be called a static random potential. Um, and then, and say they're IID. Um, and then these are short range interactions. So we're in one, two, or three dimensional space, and the interactions are over just short distances in that space. Sorry, what do you mean by static? Time independent. Time independent. Time independent. Yeah. So it's a time independent Ham I, I, you know, I said it's a time independent Hamiltonian. So, and this is one of the parameters which is time independent. Of course, the spin is the dynamic variable. Um, Those are, those are spin op Heisenberg spin op Those are three component spin operators. Yeah, right. These are Pauli matrices times a half, although the factor of a half isn't going to matter here. Yeah. I'm more in the habit of writing S instead of sigma. Yeah, but they're Pauli matrices, a absolutely. Um, OK, short range interactions. And in general, any type of interactions, uh, but we'll get specific. And then the, perhaps the most important thing is this term plus Nothing else. <laughs> OK, so, so we're talking about n spins. Um, and we're going to be interested in the thermodynamic limit. n goes to infinity. Um, and this is the entire system. So we're not coupling it to some heat bath or anything like that. No other degrees of freedom. So in particular, if this is a condensed matter system, we are making the approximation of ignoring any couplings to phonons or photons or any other extended degrees of freedom. Okay. Um, so it's an isolated quantum system, and we're going to take seriously it as being isolated and look at its own dynamics under the action of its own Hamiltonian. And so this means if it is to thermalize, um, it has to be 
its own bath. Right? So if it's going to go to equilibrium, the system has to be the bath to equilibrate the parts of the system. Right? And, and, and we're, basic, we're asking the question, basically, what, type of model, what types of models like this succeed in doing that and what types don't? And, and I'm particularly interested in the phase transition between those two uh, regimes. Um, so so uh, just, if you just define those operators, so and what phase they're working on, so that those that are not so familiar with quantum statistical mechanics. Right, okay, so this is a spin a half, which is, yeah, what, what are we, uh, what should I say? Right. So, so it's a two level quantum system. The spin, is, uh, well, the, the operators are two by two matrices. The family of Pauli matrices are, are 1, 0, 0, minus 1, which is, the, is SZ, 0, 1, 1, 0, which is SX. So we're operating, each, at each site we have two states, which is, uh, and then 0i minus i, or minus that, which is the, the y component of the spin. So these are the three components of the spin. These are all the non-integer, right, of course, two by two Hermitian operators consist of the identity operator and these three operators, which are the three Pauli matrices. Um, and those, so this is, this here is any operator that's Hermitian and operates on a two level system. And this here is any operator which is Hermitian and operates on two two-level systems. Okay. But the full Hilbert space is the product of all these two-state Hilbert spaces from all the spins. And so, it's a, so we have a, a two to the n dimensional uh, Hilbert space for the whole problem. Is this the tensor product of, of C2? Right, uh, right, which is the tensor product of, of a bunch of two-level systems, two-state Hilbert spaces over uh, at, e at each site. So at each site, we have a two-state Hilbert space, right, C2, and the full Hilbert space is uh, just the tensor product of all those. But the only operators we have in our Hamiltonian are operators operating on one spin or on two spins. So they're just l operating locally. So, it's, so the idea is the physical Hamiltonian with local interactions uh, in real space. Um, I don't know, is that enough, enough said along those lines? Anybody has more questions, please. Uh, yeah, please interrupt. Please yes. <laughs> um, okay, so this is the general model. Now I'm going to write down two specific models. Uh, one is the one we've l studied carefully, done a lot of diagonalizations of instances of. So this is now the spin a half chain in a random field. So sum i equals 1 to L, h i s i z. So now I've, instead of putting the random field in an arbitrary direction, we're putting it in uh, the z direction. And then plus j s i dot s i plus 1. And then uh, I equals 1 to L, and L plus periodic boundary condition, so L plus 1 equals 1. So this is on a circle. You know, L spins with periodic boundary conditions. In the absence of the random field, this is the spin a half chain, which Beta solved uh, 75 years ago or more. Um, but, and we put a random field on, along the z direction uh, to, well, introduce the disorder that way. Um, right, and so, and, and then we choose this, specifically we choose this H. The H's, HI's are IID random variables, uh, which are uniform in uh, minus H to H. So that's a specific model we've looked at. And then one can also do an Ising case, which is perhaps even simpler than this model where you just change this to a transverse field Ising model instead of a Heisenberg spin chain. So I equals 1 to L H I S I Z plus transverse field S I X 
plus j siz si plus 1z. So this would be the, the Ising version. Again, it's a transverse field Ising model, which is exactly solvable, but then with a longitudinal random field. Um, and this may be the simplest instance of the physics I'm talking about today. Okay. So specifically for this model, I'm going to say a little bit about its behavior and summarize uh, some aspects of what we've learned about it sort of as a, as a summary of my talk right now. Okay. So, so what we've, so let's consider this model here, a spin chain with a random field. Um, the Hamiltonian is random, right? You pick the random fields, it gives you a particular Hamiltonian, and then you look at all the eigenstates of it and look at the dynamics of that, right? And then we, you know, as a matter of you know, practice, we do that for many realizations of the Hamiltonian to get good statistics on the behavior. Um, and I say high temperature, actually I didn't really, yeah, let me, you know, when, I, when, I, when I say high temperature here, what I mean is temperatures of order the random fields and the interactions. So the random fields are of comparable magnitude to the interaction. That's the regime I'm interested in where it's both disordered strongly and also strongly interacting. Um, and I want my temperatures to be on that scale or higher. So unlike traditional, a lot of traditional uh, condensed matter physics, I'm not focusing on the low temperature or the ground state behavior. I'm focusing on high temperatures. Okay. But you can even forget temperature. Exactly. So, so in, in practice, what we're going to do is we're going to, you know, we've gone through the trouble of diagonalizing all these Hamiltonians and we get all the eigenstates and so let's use them all. And if we're looking at them all and giving them all equal weights in our analysis, we're effectively looking at infinite temperature. So, so, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to T equals infinity, which just basically means looking at all states equally likely of this, of this uh, in this Hilbert space, just weighting all states in this Hilbert space equally likely. Um, and in that limit, this model here has a fifth interest, well, has a simple phase diagram, interesting and simple. So H over J, right? So H is the strength of the random field. The random fields are of magnitude, their magnitude is distributed between zero and H. Um, J is the interaction, so that's the parameter. Now there's a special point here, which is the one beta solved, so that's zero, and that model is integrable. So that's a special model with all sorts of conservation laws, and what happens around here is an interesting topic, which I'm not talking about. Okay, <laughs> so there's. So, Well, just to say that this is a point, and as soon as you add a random field, it goes over into the, the what I'm, what I'm going to call the ergodic phase. Okay, so, so what we believe happens here is there, is a, there, is, there are two phases and a special point here. Um, the critical value is around 3.5, rather roughly. Um, and over here at strong random field, the system is localized, and over here it thermalizes. It does equilibrate in the thermodynamic limit under its own dynamics from, from uh, you know, from almost all initial conditions drawn from this Hilbert space. And okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, right, and then in, in answer to your question here, there's a special point here, and we believe that's a special point, and as soon as you put on the random field, you break all the conservation laws of the integrable model, or all except conservation of energy, and this model also has conservation of total SZ, 
So there's two conservation laws here, total SZ and energy. Um, but as far as we know, a random field breaks all the other conservation laws that the uh, integrable problem has. Uh, we don't know that for sure, but that's, uh, and, and, and so this is a special point which is unstable in this direction. And there's an interesting critical phenomena approaching this of how you cross over from this thermal or ergodic behavior to the integral behavior. Um, and, so, and that's a big area of research um, that, that I'm sort of, I'm staying away from, okay? <laughs> Both today and also in my own work. <laughs> you know, I look at those papers sometimes, but I don't, it's, it's something I, I've stayed away from. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is, uh, so what I'm interested in today is the nature of these two phases and this phase transition, okay? And what I'm gonna do now, sort of as a summary of the talk, is I'm gonna list the differences between these two phases aspects of the differences between these two phases that I think are important. I'm going to use terms that may not be well defined yet. Um, I will try to define some of them. Um, and, and to the extent I don't, please ask. Um, uh, okay. Well, I, I already have a question. Yeah. <laughs> when you make that separation, are you doing this for all energies or a particular energy or what? Because energy does play a role here. Right, so this is, this, right, it's infinite temperature, so by that I mean we're, we're looking at all states, all states with equal weights. Yes. Now, of course, um, well, states and states we're going to take the thermodynamic limit, yes. right, and these will be the behaviors for almost all states, right? Now, there will be... Can't you get coexistence? Yeah, you right, you, you, in this phase... If you take very low energy states out in the tail of the density of states, they are localized. Okay. But in the thermodynamic limit, they have exponentially small probability you know, in, the de in the density of states. Right. Yeah. So, so when we, if we turned on the temperature, there would be a phase boundary. Say I lowered the temperature in this direction. There would be a phase boundary coming over like this. And, at, and the localized phase would extend further over, right? But if I just say infinite temperature and take the thermodynamic limit, I'm only looking at zero energy density, you know, within square root of L, uh, one over square root of L in energy density. So, 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 you know, in the limit, you end up at a specific energy density. And, and would you translate this into the behavior of the eigenstates now? Or yeah, yeah. Or? yeah, 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 yeah. Right, so I'm gonna, right, okay. Right, so, so two undefined terms already, right? <laughs> okay, this phase appears to be ergodic in some sense. This one is certainly non-ergodic, okay? So one important thing is that if you apply statistical mechanics to this and ask, what does, you know, statist equilibrium statistical mechanics is supposed to tell you what the system does at long times if you just let it equilibrate. And in this phase, statistical mechanics does not answer that question because the system is non-ergodic. Over here it appears to. Um, okay, so that's, so that's one distinction. Uh, and, and all these things that I'm going to list are related, but they're different perspectives on the same thing. So over here, the system... So that's the integrable point only there. So here, the system is a heat bath. So the infinite system constitutes a heat bath over here. And here it is not a heat bath. Uh, and what do we mean by a heat bath? One thing a heat bath has, OK, so the local spectrum here is, uh, is, a continu is continuous, and here it's discrete. Right. Why does it fail to be a heat bath? It fails to be a heat bath because its local energy levels are discrete, and so it cannot, you know, what a heat bath does is it accepts, it, it, it both takes and gives energy 
in whatever unit you need to, you know, it, it can give it in any amount, right? So it has a continuous spectrum. It can absorb energy in any quantum with any magnitude. Whereas in a, over, over here, the reason it fails to be a heat bath is because the spectrum is discrete. And so uh, it can't uh, take energy or give energy from a two-level system of a given splitting, uh, except on rare occasions where they happen to be resonant. But that happens with probability zero. Um, okay, so that now the the uh, if we diagonalize the Hamiltonian, look at the eigen energies, we can ask how are they spaced? What is the level statistics like in random matrix theory? Matrix theory and in the thermal phase, the, the level statistics are Wigner-Dyson GOE level statistics, um, whereas in the localized phase, they're just Poisson. The levels are just Poisson distributed with no level repulsion. Okay. Um, over, over here, you have transport. The system does transport energy. It'll transport spin, and it'll transport quantum coherence and quantum information. Whereas over here, uh, the DC transport, or no DC transport. So no, no steady transport. Right? If you have a temperature gradient over here, you won't get a, a heat flow. It'll last for, you know, that energy gradient, energy density gradient will will last forever because there's no, con no conduct conduction of energy in, in the steady. Uh, okay. And over here, because of all these things, uh, you have decoherence that if you, you know, take one of these spins and put it in a particular state to try to write, say, some quantum information on it, under the action of the Hamiltonian, that information will rapidly spread over the entire system, and that's what decoherence is. It's really, decoherence isn't loss of quantum information, it is the transport of quantum information and the sort of hiding of quantum information by having it go into so many degrees of freedom that it's just hopeless to get it back out, um, to detect it. Whereas over here, uh, it can be coherent. You can actually store you can put a qubit in a particular state, and even though it's interacting strongly with the nearby qubits, that quantum state can, can last forever um, in an ideal situation. Um, and then if we talk about the... People who want to do quantum computing, what do they want? They want the localized quantum computing. Yeah, right, right, <coughs> right. So this is... Yeah, no, this, this stuff is all bad news for quantum computing because um, you want to you know, control your quantum state and have it, have it always. And now the, the many-body eigenstates, many-body, so the eigenstates of the full many-body Hamiltonian, um, right. So over here they are... Uh, they have in extensive entanglement. Um, whereas over here, they only have local entanglement. And they are thermal here, whereas here, they're athermal. So there is the uh, idea of, well, uh, you know, this, this is one thing I want to, in particular, want to want to explain what I mean by that. Um, okay, so that's sort of a, a summary. And then there's a phase transition between these, which is, like from this point of view, it's a glass transition, right, from something that equilibrates to something that doesn't. So it's a glass in that sense. Um, and it's also the breakdown of quantum statistical mechanics. 
right? Now, it's a phase transition occurring at high temperatures in one dimension, right? Which violates superficially some theorems, because you know, we were told you can't have phase transitions at non-zero temperature in one dimension. But if you ask what are the assumptions of those theorems, the assumption is statistical mechanics applies. Whereas this is a phase transition where that assumption breaks down. So of course it doesn't violate the theorem. <laughs> it just violates the assumption. <laughs> um, okay. Now, okay, so there's a lot of this. No, I mean literally extensive. Um, uh, okay, so, so, so since you asked, let me, okay, so, so we can take our system, which is, right, you know, the, more generally it may not be a one-dimensional system, but for the one-dimensional system, so we have the eigenstate of the one-dimensional system, many-body eigenstate of the one-dimensional system, and then what we do, let's cut out a section of length L here, and we're going to write that eigenstate in terms of a Schmidt decomposition of states inside this block and the states outside this block and evaluate the entanglement, right? So, so we say we have an eigenstate uh, n, right? So, so, so actually, let me just, of course, we're doing, eigen, we're doing eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. So h n equals e sub n n, right? And so we have an eigenstate n, which can be written as sum over some index alpha, some, uh, I guess what's the right way of writing it? Yeah. Square root of p alpha. Um, and then I suppose I can write n in outer product n, n, right. And yeah, let me just do it that way a little more carefully, sorry. And alpha in outer product and alpha out. Okay, so this is a state on the Hilbert space of this block, in meaning in the block. And this is a state on the Hilbert space of the rest of the system, out meaning outside of the block. Right? And what any eigenstate can be decomposed in a product like this, which is the so-called Schmidt decomposition. Um, and, these, uh, so, and, and if these are normalized states, then the, this is the square root of a probability. Right? That's why I wrote it that way, square root of p sub alpha, because those, those add up to 1. Uh, the p sub alpha is add up to 1. Um, and the entanglement entropy, the von Neumann entanglement entropy, is just sum over alpha. Uh, p sub minus p sub log p alpha. Um, and that is the entropy of the reduced density matrix of the block. Right? So we can look at the reduced density matrix of the block in state n. So this is, this is uh, trace over all degrees outside of the block. And N, right? So if we take the state, the, the density matrix for the pure state of the whole system, and then we take a trace over all degrees of freedom outside the block, that gets the reduced density matrix of the block in eigenstate n of the full system. Right? And this, this probability distribution has this entropy. Right? I mean, you define the, the von Neumann entropy. Yeah, in fact, this is, this is just equal to sum over alpha p sub alpha n alpha in n alpha in. Right. Yeah, when you define your decomposition, uh, you cut the interaction between the inside and outside. Okay, no, this is just for a state. Yeah, I mean for the state. It's for a state. So the state, is, the state is an eigenstate of the full Hamiltonian. Yeah, but, but then you said, and then, the inner, when you, this is. I understand, but it's sum, yeah, the theorem is in sum. What is n alpha inner? n alpha subscript. Right, if, if I take this state and I 
uh, cut the Hilbert space into two parts, which are product of the in part and the outer part. Now, this is all about states and nothing about Hamiltonians, right? Once I have a state, I can rewrite it in terms of its Schmidt decomposition, and that, ha that doesn't refer to the Hamiltonian at all, right? That's just about rewriting the state in terms of uh, states in one part of the Hilbert space times states in the other part of the Hilbert space. Um, and you know, the non-triviality of quantum mechanics has to do with this sum having more than one term, of course, <laughs> and that's the entanglement. And the, von Neu the, the, entang the entropy of entanglement measures, measures that. Um, and so when I say extensive entanglement, I mean extensive in the technical sense, meaning in proportion to the volume of the region. So, so, the, so the, the entanglement over here of a block of length L with the rest of the system is proportional to L. And in fact, it is just the e in fact, it's just L times log 2 because we're at infinite temperature. But, but that's, I'm getting ahead of myself now. Um, OK. But let me, uh, you know, since, since we're, you know, this, this problem is of physical interest, but I think it's, uh, you know, the localization problem uh, for the single particle problem, the l existence of the localized state has been proven. Um, and so for this problem here as well, if you ask what part of this story I'm telling you has hope of becoming mathematically rigorous, it's over here, you know, at, at the limit of strong random field is, is where there's, there's some hope. Um, so I want to say a little bit about that limit first, just because in some sense that's the simplest limit, and you know, which is why there is some hope of making a proof. Um, okay, so if we take the limit, so for j equals zero, right? One way of taking that limit, of course, is to just take j to zero, which means you turn off the interaction, right? So if we turn off the interaction, we have a very simple Hamiltonian, which is just Right, so h is sum over i, uh, h i, s i, z, um, which means, well, we, it's no longer really a many body problem, it's just a sum of a bunch of single spin problems. And the eigenstates, so the, the, uh, you know, the eigenstates are just you know, some sequence of up, up, down, up, down, down, right? The eigenstate of this on each side is the spin is either up or down. Um, and any sequence of those at each site, right, site 1, 2, you know, 1, all the way to L, uh, that denotes an eigenstate of this Hamiltonian. It's very trivial, right? Um, and it is a product state. There's no entanglement. Uh, very simple. Um, and basically, what this paper, Bosco, Elena, Altschuler did, although not in terms of spins, in terms of uh, you know, interacting particles, but the, the arguments they made are basically to say using perturbation theory as in the hands of a th you know, theoretical physicists who really know how to use perturbation theory, but this is not rigorous work, um, that these states which are, uh, have all these properties here, um, those properties survive to turning on the interactions to yeah, some value. Just, right? right. So what happens when you add the interactions is the state is no longer a simple product of these. You get all sorts of spin exchanges and entanglement between these spins and the, uh, the uh, the eigenstates of, the, of this Hamiltonian here with the interaction are, are non-trivial, but they only have short-range entanglement. Um, so that if you cut, cut it out like this and look at the entanglement, the entanglement really is only present near the cut, and it doesn't propagate deep into the interior yeah. of the block. Um, David? Yeah? Is P alpha depend on N or not? Yes, certainly, certainly.
and they sum oh, when summed on alpha they give 1 yeah. Yeah. sorry okay so in this li in this in this limit of 0j this is a, you know, the eigenstates are trivial um, so the many-body eigenstates, they certainly don't look like a thermal distribution, right? A thermal distribution at infinite temperature is really just all states equally likely, whereas here an eigenstate, uh, you know, is a specific state, right? Um, there's no entanglement, so the, the local is not only, not even not extensive entanglement, there's no entanglement at all. Um, if I made a linear combination of this state and this state, where I flipped this spin, and I put, to put a particular linear combination of these two states, all the other states are the same, that spin will then subsequently, under the action of this Hamiltonian, just Larmor persists about the field and remain coherent. And, the, and the, you know, all the quantum information I wrote on this qubit will just stay at that place, just Larmor precessing. Um, of course, there's no transport. If I put any energy here by doing that, that energy stays right there. The spin density stays right there. Um, if you think about the level statistics, the energy of this guy is just the sum of these fields times the sine of the spin. So you're just summing up a bunch of variables, um, and there's no, no reason for level repulsion. Uh, the local spectrum is clearly discrete because the operator at this site really just has two states differing by, differing by the local field in energy. Um, and of course, if you couple this to something, it, it's, not, it's not a heat bath. Um, and it's not ergodic. Okay. So that's... Uh, right. So for the single part, uh, let me make the analogy to the single particle problem. So I'll write out the single particle problem more explicitly here. So if we have a, a single particle hopping, uh, how should I write it? Um, yeah, no, that's uh, actually I think I won't go in that. I won't go in that direction. Um, Okay, so our understanding of what happens in the localized phase is when we turn on the interactions, each of these 2 to the n states, so there's, well, 2 to the l, length l, so there's 2 to the l eigenstates, which are just all the bit strings here. Each one of these deforms in some way and becomes a linear combination of it and its neighbors under spin exchange. Um, they remain an orthonormal set, um, but, but the, the, you know, the, the physics of them, there's still 2 to the L of them, and each of them still has a local degree of freedom, which can be either up or down. Uh, it's just the local degree of freedom is no longer just a single spin, but it's, it's a single spin and its environment. Right? And, and so what we've... What we've uh, what we believe and what we've tested numerically with this Hamiltonian is, okay, so for j bigger than 0, but h over j bigger than h over j c, so we're in the localized phase, okay, so now we make, find, just, just take an eigenstate, N. So we take our Hamiltonian in the localized phase. Just take one of the eigenstates, okay, N. And then what we do, what you can do is you can hit it with the spin operator at site I, okay. And then take all the other eigenstates and find which one did you get the biggest overlap with, right? So you take your eigenstate n, you hit it with the spin operator i, and then you ask, what did I get? And let's expand that in terms of all the other many-body eigenstates. And so we're going to take the supremum 
over all the, all the other many-body eigenstates and find which M has the biggest matrix element through the spin uh, at site I in state N. Right? And then with this construction, then you can consider the state, so, so then you consider the state um, Un plus Vm, where these are two complex numbers, u squared plus v squared equals 1. So what I've done now is I've made a two-level system out of these two, eigen, these two many body eigenstates, and I've chosen state M to be the one which you get the biggest amplitude for by letting the spin operator at site I operate on state N. Right? And this state here, what we have now is we have a qubit which is near site I. And so if I look. Um, in this state, uh, see what's what's the right way of saying that? Well, basi basically, if I look at look at uh, S J between state N and state M, and this thing decays as e to the minus i minus j over some localization length. So what was bef when I had j equals zero? My spin excitation was just a spin flip on a given site, and it was purely on that site, right? And, and in that sense, truly localized, fully localized on one site. When you're in the localized phase, but you know, in the middle of it, when you have interactions, the excitations are not localized on one site. They're localized inside some exponentially decaying envelope, some random function inside an exponentially decaying envelope. So you can make, you know, there, there is a two-level system there which has coherence and is localized, right? And so this here allows you to write a qubit which, because it's in terms of eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, it lives forever, and it stays put near the, the site where you, you put it. Um, in spite of the fact that we now have significant interactions with all the nearby degrees of freedom. But the nearby degrees of freedom do not constitute a heat bath which will decohere this, this, this state. Um, so, so that's one of the striking things about, about this localized uh, phase. Is it, is it uh, Yeah, could you just you write down the way you explain this is done to me? Is this a spin-spin correlation? Say it again. Right, it's a spin-spin correlation, perhaps. So you wrote it, you put the ends in there. When you explain this to John and me, you, you have a you have a spin i, spin j, and then n n, and then. You yeah, well, there's various constructions you can make, right? The uh, right, so 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 the state. Right, there's there, there's various things to say about this. So states m and n made by this construction differ only near site i, right? So if I looked at, for example, the expectation value of the spin j in site m versus the same spin in state n, this would also decay exponentially. Not sure whether this would have the same. Well, some of these things end up being squares of the wave functions and some one power of the wave functions. So there's some factors of two that I have to think about carefully. But basically, you know, the idea in the localized phase is it still is just a bunch of two level systems strung along the chain. And their, their uh, interactions, or well, you know, basically, yeah. If you if you excite one of those two-level systems, the information, the excitation will not propagate. It'll stay where you put it. Um, 
the specific two-level system that you know, is the difference between state M and state N will depend on which Hamiltonian we have with which random fields in the vicinity of site I, and it will depend on which particular eigenstate we started with, N, in order to make the other state. So, so, so it's, it's not trivial like this one, where the two-level system is just the spin for every eigenstate. It's the same operator. Whereas here, the operator that gets, well, you know, there's, an opera, there's a spin excitation operator here, which is simply just this operator, right, which annihilates state n and makes state m. That's, a, that's the spin flip operator for this qubit I'm making. And the claim is this is an operator which has you know, support only near state i. Its, its content decays exponentially as you go away. Um, now this is, a, this is a scenario. We've tested it numerically in the phase and seen that things decay this way. Um, Okay, right. So we would expect the correlation length diverges as you approach the phase transition. The numer the, uh, right. So the quality of the numerics we can do are not sufficient to really have confidence about these things. Okay, so um, because over here, so the, the difficult part of this, you know, both for possible mathematical proofs as well as for numerics, it's actually this phase where the system equilibrates that's the hard part, right? And it's hard because it has extensive entanglement. So the quantum state is, you know, the, the eigenstates over here are highly entangled states with properties that are, you know, hard to, uh, to really understand. And there's no simple numerical methods that allow you to do this short of just brute force diagonalization of the Hamiltonian. See, over here, where you have only short-range entanglement, there are other methods that work. So this phase can be, if you stay away from the phase transition, this phase can be studied on much longer systems with other methods like DMRG uh, because you can exploit the fact that it's weakly entangled and use that to, to, to do things more efficiently. So, so what size can you, do you feel confident uh, that they both like? So, so in, terms of, well, in terms of studying the phase transition, we, you know, we wanted to locate it, we wanted to have good statistics, which means we need to make multiple copies of the Hamiltonian and diagonalize you know, many, many copies. And so we really just did it up to L equals 16 because that, you know, that was the biggest size where we could conveniently, you know, without, without an enormous project, enormous numerical project, uh, get good statistics. And the, you know, the, the difficulty goes up exponentially with L and the amount more you learn doesn't go up very rapidly with L. So, so we, we did not see that it was worthwhile pushing that barrier you know, as a numerical project because you know, it, just, it, it didn't seem like it was likely to be worth the candle. Um, but there's an interesting question. You know, I, I've, all, I've sort of, you know, you would expect it's a phase transition, the localization length diverges. Um, but sometimes I get a feeling maybe that does maybe that logic does. See, this is a different type of phase transition than we're used to, um, and 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 I'm always nervous about just taking all our sort of folklore or knowledge <laughs> about phase transitions and assuming it applies here. Um, and so it's it's very interesting. It's you know it's a new type of phase transition, and it's it's really there's really no theory of the transition. Um, you can't just take the theory of single particle localization and apply it here. You can't take equilibrium phase transition stuff and apply it here. So, so I, think, I think it's really open questions. Let me uh, try to do another, you know, there, there's, a, there's a lot to say here, but one thing I want to say, which I think is, is uh, you know, I want to say something about this side, and in particular I want to say what I mean here. Uh, what do I mean by thermalization? If, if that's okay for the next talk, is there any, any other stuff that seems maybe more important to, to do first? Uh, Elliot. I, I haven't quite got understood the connection between I, N, and M. Uh, in this, uh, you, you think 
So I is a site. It's the same I as over here. Yeah. And N is an eigenstate. So this is since it's inside a cat, it's a label for a right. I wrote uh, wrote that right. So they're unrelated. You take any N and any I and do this construction. And it'll give you the it'll give you an M. And that M differs from N by just a local operation. If you're in the localized phase, it will differ from M by a local operation which occurs in the vicinity of I. Yeah. Regardless of what I, I take. Yeah. 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 Well, maybe you can say it just, just by this, uh, how I was. Right. So, so if, I took, if I took this state here and I did it on this site I, right? The state I would get would be, of course, this operator contains the lowering operator. And so I would get M would be this guy. Right? Regardless of what N is? No, say this is N. If this is N. Or if this is I. Right, N is a particular eigenstate. Nothing to do with I. Right, so I have a particular Hamiltonian and a particular eigenstate. Right? And say the eigenstate is this. Right, so of course, in the no interaction case, this is trivial, or simple, shall we say. <laughs> so say this is n, right? And say this is site i right here, right? And I hit this with the spin operator, and I, you know, in, contained in here is flipping the spin, because this, this vector contains the lowering operator. And so I will get some overlap with this state. And in fact, that's the only state which will give overlap in this case, right? Um, but you could do this for any n and any site i, right? And you will get a particular m. And this operator here, you thereby construct, is the spin flip op is the analog of the spin flip operator uh, for that particular Hamiltonian and that particular site i and that particular eigenstate n, right? Yes, right. The M depends on I and N and the Hamiltonian. But N does not depend on N. Right, right. No, I pick, right, yeah. I take, I take a given Hamiltonian, a given N, a given I, and that'll give me a given M, which will depend on all of those things before. Um, yeah, that's right. And as long as this operator is something which just acts locally, I still have a local qubit, right? Of course, in the thermal phase, if I do this construction, these matrix elements are all very small in the volume, exponentially small in the volume, but I'll still find a supremum. And, but then this operator will be something which is, ever, you know, which is not local at all, right? It's, it's just something that acts everywhere in the whole space, David, real space. Can, can I repeat my uh, request, which is to write uh, the spin-spin correlation in state n. This is how you explain it to John and me. I think it's, it's a little. The, the spin spin correlation in state n. In other words, for S, I, yeah. S, yeah. J, it's, the same, it's a similar thing. It's not the same thing. Well, okay, so one thing we looked at was, was uh, yeah, S, S, I, Z, S, J, Z in state n minus, S, you know, just the, cor just the usual correlation function. Okay, so this we called C I J Z Z N, and it also depends on the Hamiltonian. <laughs> um, but this also, right, this also decays exponentially with distance in the localized phase, but not in the thermal phase. So that's another way, this is another way of distinguishing between the two phases, which involves just looking at one eigenstate and just looking at the spin-spin correlations in one eigenstate. And this works here for this model with the conserved SZ because if I flip, if in the eigenstate, if I flip the spin at site I, that quantum of spin has to go somewhere else. But if we have localization, it has to be nearby, right? And, and, and it's nearby inside an envelope that decays exponentially, right? Whereas in the thermal phase, it's everywhere else in the whole system, and you find that this correlation function doesn't decay with distance. But the decay of that, uh, that two-point correlation 
Right. Is a signal for localization. Yes. Right. right. And yes. All these sets of things. Yes. 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 So yes. It's essentially equivalent to what you've been yes. explaining to us, but it's a little more canonical for me, anyhow. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay. And and, um, and then how would it decay in the thermal side? How, how, how okay, so in this model here, yes. with the conservation law, yes. in the thermal phase, what happens is this correlation function, well, it, right, it's positive, right, it's, it's typically, it's positive on site. Because of the conservation law, it's sum over distance has to be zero. There's a sum rule on it. So it's positive at distance zero. And then it does something at short distances. And then at long distances, it's of order 1 upon L. And it doesn't depend on distance. And that's because basically what it's, like I said, SZ is conserved. If I flip the spin on site I, that quantum of spin has to be somewhere else. But in the ergodic phase, it's equally likely to be everywhere else. And so that's why you get a negative correlation, which is of order 1 upon L, because that flipped quant that quantum of spin, which with the correlation function I'm saying is not at this site, it could be anywhere else. Right? So that's uniformly and, and, spread over the system. Yeah, it's uniformly spread over the system. Right. And, and, and again, th this is something we, in our numerics, yeah, we looked at this. You see this behavior in the, in the thermal phase, independent of distance, order 1 upon L going away is, and, and then you see it in the, in the localized phase. Instead, it goes like this, and it's negative, but decaying exponentially with the, uh, with the localization length in the localized phase. Um, and th yeah, that's one of the measures we used in our, this paper here. Th those data are shown <laughs> on the numerics. Um, say something about the transition itself, or is that something you're still um, uh, trying to figure out? Fairly like, little. Like Peter's question about the, the localization length or anything else, what can you tell us about the transition? What do you think happens there? Um, I'm just trying to think, should I, yeah, what can I? Um, yeah, well, we have ideas about it. Should, should I try to do that or try to talk about the th thermalization? Well, we don't have much time left, so we're okay. going to talk, <laughs> talk more later. Yeah, later. yeah. Okay. So, so since, since you, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll say some thoughts about that, uh, again, related to, so in the single particle problem, uh, Ander, single particle Anderson localization, There's an idea which is, I'm not sure if it's due to Thales, but it's, Thales' name is associated with it, which is at the transition, so at the transition, the, at the transition in a system of L by L by L equals L to the D. So the single particle Anderson localization transition only occurs for dimensions bigger than two. So we got to be in at least three dimensions to have this discussion. Um, but the Hilbert space of a single particle has the dimension of the real space, right? If we have a L by L by L system with L to the D sites, the Hilbert space has dimension L to the D. Whereas over here, the Hilbert space has dimensions 2 to the L, right? So this is an infinite dimensional, right? This, this is like infinite dimension on the single particle problem. So that's why the one dimensional many body problem can have a phase transition, even though the single particle problem, you have to go up to three dimensions to see the transition. It's because the, the one dimensional problem is in some sense infinite dimensional because the Hilbert space is infinite dimensional. Uh, Okay, so at the transition in a finite size system, you have uh, the, uh, the particle 
there's a particle diffusion rate, which is how long it takes a particle to diffuse across the system, which of course in the localized phase uh, that rate is zero because it doesn't diffuse, whereas in the extended phase it does diffuse. And so the particle diffusion rate uh, is the Thales energy over h bar. That gives a rate, right? Uh, an energy divided by h bar gives a, gives a rate. Um, and so this is the Thales energy. That's, that basically defines the Thales energy. Right. Okay. So that's the dynamic relaxation rate. If you, you know, if your particle density is not uniform, it will relax to whatever it's going to be at equilibrium with this rate, which is set by the size of the system. Um, and and the conjecture, or the well, what's true as far as we can tell at the transition. So at the transition, uh, the Thales energy is of the same order as the level spacing, which, which goes as 1 over L to the D. So in a system with L to the D sites, there are L to the D states over a finite band. And so the spacing between the quantum levels is 1 over L to the D. Um, and the localization transition is basically when the dynamics of the system slows down so much that it's slower than a quantum system of that size can capture with that level spacing. Right? Okay. So, this, so this is what happens in the single particle problem. So now we go to the many particle problem. Now we can still define the Thales energy, right? We can, we can have a finite size system, right? We can ask what is the slowest relaxation in that system, right? If the energy is non-uniform or the den density is non-uniform, what's the time scale for it to relax to equilibrium? So if we, we can conjecture the same thing, the Thales energy goes is that at the transition, Um, the Thales energy goes as the level spacing. But now it's the level spacing of a many-body Hamiltonian, which in, say, our one-dimensional problem goes as 2 to the minus L. Right? So here we have um, the rate going as 1 over length to the D. So in terms of dynamic critical phenomena, the dynamic critical exponent z is equal to d for the Anderson transition, single particle localization in d dimensions. That's why two dimensions is the marginal dimension, because two dimensions, you have diffusion already immediately as soon as you put disorder, and you're already at the scaling for the transition. Right? But in three dimensions, um, diffusion gives a Thales energy much larger than the level spacing, and so that can give you proper diffusion. Um, so here we now have the relaxation time, or the relaxation rate, goes exponentially in the length of the system. So we believe the dynamic critical exponent for our transition is z goes to infinity. There's not power loss. So this transition, the scaling between length scales and times, is probably not a power law. It's probably something stronger like this. Um, and we've, again, checked that against the numerics over a modest range of length scales. Um, and it's consistent. Um, so I think the theory we're looking for is a, a dynamic scaling theory which, which has this property, or something close to this at least. And this is also the property that a lot of, z so there's a bunch of zero temperature random quantum critical points which are understood 
through the techniques originally due to Maud Dasgupta and then extended in a lot of detail by Daniel Fisher. Um, and they all have infinite dynamic critical exponent. So we sort of suspect that this phase transition here is, is in perhaps in a universality class that's similar to, to those, to, the, to the, the random spin chain type scaling that's been found. But that may just be because that's what we know, <laughs> right? And it's, you know, we just don't know anything else. So of all the things we know, that's the thing it seems most like. <laughs> but, uh, 